good to be here. Another beautiful fall day. Uh, good to have Jack and Denise back visiting with us, and anyone else that's out there visiting. Um, I want to uh, extend uh, an invitation that anyone that, that is here that is a, a true believer and uh, baptized into Christ to join us as we partake of the, the cup and the, and the bread. Bob came up to me today and he goes, uh, do you realize what you have today? And I was like, yeah, I got a new sound booth. He goes, no, you got a new mess station. I was like, oh, no, I didn't realize that. So, you know, it, it's one of those things that, that God just gives you. Because when you come and know that uh, God gave his son so much for us, And it's a time to just come in and meditate on that. That he loved you so much. That he would give up something of value. He would give his only son. And that value is something that I think people overlook. You know, we may value our car you know, material things. But those that, that are a parent and a child and that value that comes there, because that's part of you. God gave us part of himself for us. And as we take the cup, which is the blood that was shed for our sin, Father, we just thank you so much today. A time to come and worship. A time to just be with you. Feel your presence. And honor you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.
you know, as I, I came earlier this morning and trying to get things, and, and I was going to move the piano out, and I, I got it all the way around the corner, and Jim walks in. Uh, we're going to need the piano today. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> then I said something to Deb. I said, I almost moved your piano. Well, actually, I did, but, and she goes, well, you might need earplugs. I don't think I needed earplugs. Thank you so much, Deb. That was beautiful. Um, but on that same line is, as we come before offering, it's, it's service. It's service for God. And that's all we have, is to serve God with all that we have and all that we are. So as we pass the collection plate, just serve God with all that you are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for a, a wonderful day again. And uh, to be able to serve you with the talents that you've given. Technology don't fail me now. Oh, I guess the kids are dismissed. At least there's a whole herd. Just as a public service announcement, I think there are some things everybody ought to know. Number one, October is Adopt a Shelter Dog Month. It's Domestic Violence Awareness Month. More importantly, it's Eat Country Ham Month. National Vegetarian Month. I'm going to skip that one. Down Syndrome Awareness Month. National Dyslexia Awareness Month. American Archives Month. Italian History Month, Black History Month, National Book Month, National Work and Family Month, National Disability Employment Awareness Month, National Cyber Security Awareness Month, Filipino American History Month, LGBT History Month, what? Large Gray Bookshelf? No. I'm sorry, National Bullying Prevention Month, Polish American Heritage Month, National Domestic Violence Awareness Month, Spina Bifida Awareness Month, Pregnancy Infant Loss Awareness Month, Brachial Plexus Injury Awareness Month. I think that has to do with the sternum and the throat. I'm not just positive. National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And finally, Pastor Appreciation Month. Now, something everybody ought to do, everybody just needs to do it once. October's a good month to do it. Type in National Days, because I just did the National Month. But this is Pastor Appreciation Day, and you know, there's a, there's a rule I have about traditions. I used to kind of, on tra traditions. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. 
so I don't do that much anymore. But but the rule is, if it's something you've done more than twice, it's a tradition. All right? So for eight years running, Pastor Appreciation Day is my day when I get up and speak. However, this morning, we have a guest speaker. He graduated with a degree in agronomy from Kansas State University. He holds a Master in Divinity. And he's here all the way from the Big Apple. This morning, Pastor, well, I'm trying to give you all the bill if I can, man. For those of you that don't know him, this is the one and only Pastor Jack Sweeney. Thank you, Jack, for appreciating me this month. (laughs) I tell you what, it is great to be back home, and this truly is home. It really is. And uh, I called Bob, and I said, what do you think? You want you want me to do this? And I twisted his arm a little bit, and he finally agreed to let me preach. So we're breaking tradition, and that's really hard on some people when you do that. And, uh, yeah, I'm here from all the way from the Little Apple, actually, Manhattan, Kansas, where you are not allowed to live unless you wear purple. Uh, so that's just the way it is there. And... Uh, we found that out rather quickly that if you uh, show up to any event wearing purple in Manhattan, you're immediately accepted. You are in, you are welcome, it doesn't matter. Well, I'm going to preach today on a uh, chapter in Luke, Luke 15, that probably is the most preached on chapter in the entire New Testament, probably in the entire Bible. And it has to deal with God's lost and found. Uh, There's a common phrase I've heard used in the church over and over and over again that says, if you're looking for the perfect church, you'll never find it. But if in case you think you do and you join it, it will no longer be perfect. And the simple is, truth is, this is not a perfect church. Uh, it doesn't exist. There are no perfect people here. There's no perfect people at the church in Manhattan, at University Christian at all. Um, So we're going to look at Luke 15, look at God's lost and found, because in this chapter, Jesus uses four different illustrations that truly shows the heart of our God when he deals with those that are lost. And if you ever have time, go through the chapter and underline every time you see the word lost, you'll be amazed how many times it shows up. But the very backdrop of this shows up in verses 1 and 2, where Jesus is reaching out to those that are lost those that are broken. It says tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus preach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people. And get this, he was even eating with them. Now in that day, tax collectors were considered traitors. They were extortionists working for the occupying Roman government. Sinners referred to Jews who didn't keep the Mosaic law. They were looked down upon by the Pharisees and other religious people. And these are the people that nobody cared about. These are the ones that Jesus reached out to. And this is his very reason. He said for coming into the world, he came to seek and save those who are lost. Yet when these people gathered themselves around Jesus to hear him teach and to hear him preach... The religious establishment, they got their their robes and their phylacteries all tied up in a knot, and they begin to criticize Jesus for welcoming these sinners. These are the people the religious world should have been reaching out to, yet they were the very ones that, that they shunned. So Jesus, knowing their hard hearts, knowing the the hearts of these religious people, he uses these four illustrations here in Luke 15 to teach them the value of every lost soul. And he also uses this parable to teach them that they themselves might not be as secure as they thought they are. So my goal this morning is to cover the entire chapter of Luke 15 in 25 minutes or less. So as my good friend Michael Peterson says, buckle up, buttercup. It's going to be a wild ride. So look at this. hope you can read that. If not, you got a Bible. Look at it. So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? 
Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go search for the one that is lost till he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep in the same way. There is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and turns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and have him straight away. Wow. One day, the shepherd's counting his sheep and goes, Wait a minute, let me do it again. He's missing one. And he knows the danger to the sheep. He, and he takes immediate action. It, he wants to get that sheep back in its proper place, in the flock. And when we look at this, we start realizing and we start understanding that God truly knows and God truly understands the lost condition of humanity. See, and we have a very vivid account of this this searching and saving and this shouting as an end result. And we see in it this amazing picture of salvation. I mean, the, le- the word lost that's used here is the same word in John 3.16 where it says perish. It means to be lost, ruined, destroyed. It can also refer to uh, being sent away into hell. The shepherd knows his sh- stubborn sheep is in great danger. It is headed for ruin. It is headed for destruction. And all by its own choices, by the way. In fact, the Bible says, you and I, we're like sheep. We're like sheep. We tend to wander. We tend to get distracted. And it's our own choice. Jesus knows the condition, the lost condition of your heart as well as that sheep. He, know, he understands. He knows that, that we get lost because of sin. He knows that we become a sinner because we choose to be. John 3.18, Jesus said, There's no judgment against anyone who believes in him. Anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing. See, not only does he not know the condition of the lost, he does something about it. He goes out, he searches for that lost sheep, he rescues it, he brings it home, and there is great rejoicing. I mean, He's just overjoyed at the rescue of this lost sheep. And it's very clear that Jesus here, he says, heaven gets excited. Heaven just erupts in joy when one lost soul is saved. Why? Because fellowship has been restored. Why? Because usefulness has been restored. That one lost is back where they belong. Vision chapter 2, it says, you live in this world without God and without hope. But now... Now you've been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Jesus, blood of Christ. And from there, Jesus jumps right into talking about this woman who lost a coin, a silver coin. Instead of just shrugging her shoulders and saying, "Eh," she searched for that coin. She worked hard at restoring it to its proper place. He says, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house, search very carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and call in her neighbors and say, Rejoice with me because I found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of the angels when even one sinner repents. In that day, during that time period, married women often wore a headband made up of coins strung together. A headband serves several functions. One was it declared her status as a married woman. It told other men that she was unavailable. It served that same purpose uh, as we, as our wedding rings do today. And it brought glory to the bride. That was part of her glory. As long as that coin was missing, her beauty was marred. She was incomplete. This coin was precious to this woman. And the object of this parable is to teach the value of one lost sinner to Jesus. See, we weren't created, you and I weren't created to live lives of sin and live lives of disobedience to the Lord. God made mankind for one single purpose, for his own glory. He made us in his image. He made man for fellowship. We could walk with him in the Garden of Eden. God sees the value of every single individual, every single one of us. And then in verse 10, he jumps from earth clear to heaven. 
And we're told that there's rejoicing even in the presence of angels, the angels of God. They're excited. They're rejoicing because one sinner repented. Heaven gets excited when the lost one is found. Why? Because something of value has been restored to its proper place. And it's a glorious day when a lost person is saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now Jesus moves to the lost people. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide the wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings, moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the same time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. He began to starve. And he persuaded a local farmer to hire him. The man sent him to his field to feed the pigs. Remember, he's Jewish. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. No one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am, dying of hunger. I will go home to my father, and I will say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son, please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, he embraced him, he kissed him, and his son said to him, here's his speech, he starts into it, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to his servant, just stopped him right there, he said, quick, bring the finest robe in the house, put it on him, get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, go kill the calf that we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for the son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. It's one of the neatest verses, I think, in the entire New Testament. So the party began. This younger son, he was entitled to a third of his father's estate. If you go back in Deuteronomy 21, it tells you that. But when he demanded his father's to divide it, he basically was saying, in effect, I wish you were dead. And I wish you had no more say in my life. I'm tired of you. I want to be free from you. I want to be free from your control over my life. How many of us as teenagers ever said that, or at least thought it? So... Before any of us, any of us here became, before we came to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior of our life, we were all lost. We had the same attitude, didn't we? We might as well have said to God, God, I wish you were dead. Because we were living our lives as if God was dead, right? So the son says to his father, give me. His focus is on himself. It's all about me, his life is all wrapped up in, in himself and, and uh, he cares about nobody else, doesn't really bother him about what anybody else thinks, this younger son. He wanted what the father had, but he didn't want the father. Again, this is a picture of those without Jesus Christ. They have no thought of God. Their attitude towards God is, give me, give me. They want his air, they want his food, they want his water, they want his time, they want his world. And, and the list is long. But they don't want him involved in their lives. They want what he can give them. They don't want him. So this prodigal, he takes off. Lives that wicked, self-indulgent life, totally committed to sinfulness and wickedness. And when he left home, see, he left behind all his moral restraints. Eventually, the money runs out friends who helped him spend it, they ran out. And that distant land, that mysterious land of wine, women, and song became a land of weeping and worry and sorrow. And he found out too late that sin brings separation. He finds himself broke and starving and alone, miles away from a father who did nothing but love him. By his own choices, by his own actions, he had separated himself from that father by this wide, wide gulf of sin and pride and ignorance. 
He also found out that sin brings sorrow. Life had just totally turned upside down for him. His sin robbed him of absolutely everything of value. It, it just left him hopeless and helpless in this distant land. You know, that's how sin treats all of its victims, every single one of us. It'll promise you the world. It does, doesn't it? And it'll look good, and it'll look shiny, and it'll look fun, but all it delivers is hopelessness, brokenness, desolation, and death. Nothing is sadder than a life broken by sin. First step of getting out of sin is to realize you're in sin. That's what Jesus said or calls coming to your senses. So the son comes to his senses. He, he goes home humble. He left home rejecting the father's authority, saying, give me, give me. Now he returns home saying, take me, take me, please, as a servant he goes home, he has no clue what he's going to find, but when he got there, he found a father who'd been longing and looking for his son to return. He found a father that received him with love and compassion and grace, a father who welcomed him back into the family, a father who did what no one else could do. He reestablished his lost son as worthy. Fully accepted in the family again. He gives him a kiss. He gives him a robe. He gives him a ring. He gives him shoes. And he throws this huge party. And in the same way, God works the way, that way in our lives. Because he alone determines your worth. See, God, once you come to Jesus, he, he no longer sees you as a sinner. Once you come to your senses, once you come back home to him, he sees you as a child that he loves. And he determines, he alone determines our standing in the family, not us, not anybody else. Don't ever let the devil, don't ever let your own flesh keep you down by telling you you're not worthy to be a child of God, because you are, every single one of us is. But there's one more son we have to contend with. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard the music and heard the dancing in the house, and he asked one of his servants, What's going on? Well, your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened cat. We are celebrating because of a safe return. The older brother was angry, wouldn't go in. His father came out to him, begged him, but he replied, All these years I've... Can't you just, can't you hear him in his head? Can't you hear it in your head? Can't you, I, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And all that time you never gave me even one, not even a young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. And his father said to him, look, dear son, You've always stayed by me. Everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and came back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. Now remember something here. Jesus is talking about lost things. He's dealing with the attitudes of the Pharisees and the scribes towards lost sinners, imperfect people that they look down upon. And the older brother, he portrays one who, yes, he's involved in the things of God, but who sadly has no real relationship with the father. He is often called the pouting prodigal. I don't know about you, but I've met a few of those. He might be in the father's house, but he's still lost. He's still broken. This parable has a message for people who have that same attitude, that same spirit as the older brother. People who are upset that God is blessing someone else. People who don't like it when the prodigal comes home stinking and smelling like pigs. People who refuse to rejoice over what God is doing because, well, it isn't being done their way. And if I were to guess, most of us here probably have a little bit of that older brother in us from time to time, don't we? Now, I know in this point of the story, we don't, we don't know that there's a problem in the life of the son. We don't know. But remember, 
He's the picture of the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious elite that Jesus is talking to. They had been given the law. They had the revelation of the coming Messiah. They had been given the truth. And from all outward appearances, when people looked at them, they were walking in that truth. The scribes and Pharisees, they looked good to other people. They did. But they had a really serious heart problem. Oh, man, major heart disease. They were lost and in sin. And when Jesus looked at them, he knew it. You know what? That may describe some of you here today. I don't know. You think, well, wait a minute. I'm a good moral person. I come to church. I don't cuss or drink or steal or cheat. I've been through the baptistry. I'm a church member. And from all outward appearances, you're as good as anybody else sitting around. But just as Jesus could look into the heart of the Pharisee and see his lost condition, he can look into your heart too. And see you're lost too. But you can fool all of us. You can't fool Jesus. The Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height. For I rejected him. The Lord doesn't see the things, see things the way you see them. People judge from the outward appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. I mean, you might be a good moral person. You might be active in this church. You can still be lost. What Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't even trust what you feel in your heart about this matter. Jeremiah says, human heart is the most deceitful of all things. It's desperately wicked. You know, every time I hear someone give advice to another person, I just cringe when they say, well, go with what's in your heart. Because I remember this verse The human heart is the most deceitful Who really knows how bad it is The truth is religion does not equate to salvation Being close to the things of God Doesn't equal being saved by the grace of God Not at all Being in a church doesn't make you a Christian Any more than climbing a tree makes you a squirrel It doesn't no matter how nutty you act. You can't depend on who you are or what you've done for your salvation. You must be, as Jesus said, born again. I don't want you to miss in this chapter what the father did for this older son. The father praised him for all his efforts. He reminded him. He said, everything I have is yours. In effect, the father was saying, I've value you and our relationship together much, much more than I value your work. And God says the same thing to us. He looks at us and says, I value our relationship much more than what you do. Anything you do. But this son was too wrapped up in his own legalism, too wrapped up in his own narrow-mindedness to really enjoy the fellowship with the Father. This son also wanted what the Father had he didn't want the father. He didn't want anybody else to have a father either. You know, we might look at that and we might shake our heads. But the truth is, some of that same attitude still exists in many hearts today. People want the church. They want to feel better about themselves. They really do. They want a fire insurance policy so when they die, they don't go to that burning lake of fire. But they don't want an intimate relationship with the Father. A lot of times they resent those who want that closeness. And the truth is, you are as close to the Lord as you want to be. You are. You have as much fellowship with Him as you want to have. You can have more if you want it. The question is, do you want it? So instead of getting upset when things don't go your way, you need to learn to thank the Lord for what he's doing. Instead of pouting, this older son, he could have been partying. 
could have been having a great time. You look at this, this whole chapter, and everyone except the older son is happy. The shepherd is happy. The woman is happy. The father is happy. The lost son is happy. The servants are happy. Even the pigs are happy. The only person in misery is this older brother. Well, the fatted calf probably wasn't too happy. But uh, this older brother, he's miserable because he refuses to be happy. He doesn't want to be. The feast is there. All he has to do is go in and enjoy himself. But no, he's standing out there, pouting, because he didn't get his way, because he's not the center of attention. The amazing thing about this parable, this whole chapter, there's no conclusion. There's no ending. It's open-ended. There's no... What happened to the older brother? Did he come in? Did he stay out? Did he just stomp his feet and pout the rest of the day? What? Nobody knows. You know why I think Jesus, Jesus left it this way? Because each one of us must write our own ending that story. We need to see ourselves in one of those four illustrations and write our own ending. If you're broken and lost and without Jesus today, you write your own ending. Are you going to stay out? Or are you going to come in? If you're in, things aren't quite right. Are you going to stand outside and pout? Will you get in on what the Lord is doing? The choice is yours. And the question is, what are you going to do? Stand and pray. Father, thank you for your word, for your just the amazing teaching that Jesus gives us. Father, this, this strikes right to the heart of where many of us are. Many of us are either lost we're standing there pouting. Father, we, we see a, a, an image of you that welcomes us with open arms. Lord, we ask that uh, when we see those open arms, you help every single one of us run to them, be embraced by them. Father, I ask that as you wrap your arms around every single person here, as you wrap your arms around this church, that your blessings and your worthiness will just overflow on everyone here. That you will continue to use this church in a vibrant, vital way in your kingdom. Father, walk with us. Open our eyes on a daily basis those that are lost. And help us see with compassion. Help us see with the love that you have for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God wants a relationship with us. Now's the time. Do you want a relationship with God? If you haven't given that uh, heart over to God, we sing now. Come forward.
prayer request this week, uh, raise your hand.
there, there, there you go. <laughs> I have a praise. We did get the house. Hey, yeah. All right. All right. Also was accepted, and now we need prayer for the sale of ours. Hey, we need a house <laughs> in Great Bend. <laughs> So, Jeremy, does that mean all the work that you've done on this house now starts over on the new house, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Brian, I, I'm back here. I hear uh, My nephew, Troy, just started a new clinical trial for his lung cancer Friday, and uh, we need prayers that it'll somehow work. And my brother relayed to me that the pill itself was 47 the clinical trial is paying for it, but it's ridiculous the, the cost of some of this stuff that our insurance is paying for. And I'd also like to keep the Shelton family in our prayers. They, Dora Shelton lost a son this week and on Friday, and a month ago she lost another son to cancer. And So just keep the Shelton family in there. so many things going on in our, our world, and, you know, the great thing is, is our hope is in, in Christ Jesus. It's, it's not in man. It, it's not in medicine. I mean, God has given us the ability to make things, but he's the one behind it. And, Don, and I understand that the $4,700 for a pill, but you have to figure how much time much time has God tried to show people how to do things. So it's it's all material. And our salvation is eternal. It doesn't make any difference what happens here. It's, it's eternal. And uh, I'm just going to, we do have quite a few uh, today. I'm just going to go ahead and, and read these names and then we're going to just take a silent prayer, and then I'll, I'll close. Uh, the Lin, uh, Lynn Freiberger, Stan Nielsen, Jack Dalbert, uh, Ray Rippey, Chris Turner, Kayla, Brenda Barger, Kim and Sonia, 
microphone. Perfect. All right. For announcements, uh, the first one I want to make is we talked about it last week about streaming the in, the entire service and recording it. The license it turned out to be was sixty bucks. So we now have the license. Now, for some reason, if we want to record the band rehearsing, it's 130 bucks. So no? Okay. Uh, okay. I believe the worship team has spoken. Uh, so anyway, I, I, we're going to need some help. In the sound booth, it involves running a camera, pushing a button in and out. Troy will train you. I will work with you to make sure we get recordings, but uh, we're going to be doing that. And if we can figure out a camera thing, we may even do a live stream to YouTube. So that's coming up. We also, the elders, did vote and approve. Uh, we This church is committing itself to fi sending five kids to camp at the camp director's discretion, specifically unchurched kids that he meets in his movements throughout the community and stuff. It was something he'd asked for and we just said yes. So come next summer that will all happen. This afternoon oh not again technology and the way it fails you. We have the annual burnt chicken is it the eighth one? Eighth one. Brian, we going to get it right this year? Okay. The 8th Annual Burnt Chicken Cookout slash Presters Appreciation Day. My understanding is that Jack and Denise may stay. Okay. So you can come out and burn chicken with them. And in case you're wondering, is there anything bring sides, just Okay, oh, just a minute here. In, in regards to the sides, we've posted some suggestions on Facebook. Deviled eggs and crunchy peanut butter cookies. Uh, hot rolls and crunchy peanut butter cookies. Potato salad and crunchy peanut butter cookies. Macaroni salad and, and cheesecake with crunchy peanut butter cooking crust on it. So, yeah. All right. Gwenny, you had something? I know Sonia does. Okay, Gwenna wants everybody to eat all the chicken. Okay, that's, a, that's the long and the short of that. But yes, uh, if you have guests you want to bring, bring them, because most of us are only going to eat half of the quarter. So, because the sides are what, you know, and the crunchy peanut butter cookies, just in case you are what we're here for. Yes, son. There'll be two or three here. And the trash can and the sweat tea. Yeah, Sonia spells sweet uniquely. So, yes, ma'am. And, well, you, if you need a truck to haul your crunchy peanut butter cookie, I will be here. Okay? And for those of you that haven't come before, we have a picnic ground. If you follow the, it's not yellow brick. If you follow the white gravel road out this way, we have a picnic ground and a pavilion and a, and a thing. Oh, and, and bring your chairs. Anything else? Lawn games fishing pole? We haven't got a pond yet, Tim. We're, we're working on that. Anything else for announcements? Next week, Dan Tice. The week after that, we will have Neil Stewart from camp talking to us. So, just so you know what's coming up. All right. Jim, everybody, take us out. We can't leave yet. Young one.
before we go, I'll, I'll clarify something I said earlier. I said, these guys make my job easier. Although there's work involved in 